Part 2, Chapters 15 and 16 of Democracy in America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com. Democracy in America, Volume 2, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Part 2, Chapter 15. That religious belief sometimes turns the thoughts of the Americans to immaterial pleasures. In the United States, on the seventh day of every week, the trading and working life of the nation seems suspended. All noises cease. A deep tranquillity, say, rather a solemn calm of meditation, succeeds the turmoil of the week, and the soul resumes possession and contemplation of itself. Upon this day the marts of traffic are deserted. Every member of the community, accompanied by his children, goes to church, where he listens to strange language that would seem unsuited to his ear. He is told of the countless evils caused by pride and covetedness. He is reminded of the necessity of checking his desires, of the finer pleasures which belong to virtue alone, and of the true happiness which attends it. On his return home, he does not turn to the ledgers of his calling, but he opens the book of Holy Scripture. There he meets with sublime or affecting descriptions of the greatness and goodness of the Creator, of the infinite magnificence of the handiwork of God, of the lofty destinies of man, of his duties, and of his immortal privileges. Thus it is that the American at times steals an hour from himself, and laying aside for a while the petty passions which agitate his life, and the ephemeral interest which engross it, he strays at once into an ideal world where all is great, eternal, and pure. I have endeavored to point out in another part of this work the causes to which the maintenance of the political institutions of the Americans is attributable, and religion appeared to be one of the most prominent amongst them. I am now treating of the Americans in an individual capacity and I again observe that religion is not less useful to each citizen than to the whole state. The Americans show, by their practice, that they feel the high necessity of imparting morality to democratic communities by means of religion. What they think of themselves in this respect is a truth of which every democratic nation ought to be thoroughly persuaded. I do not doubt that the social and political constitution of a people predisposes them to adopt a certain belief and certain tastes which afterwards flourish without difficulty amongst them, whilst the same causes may divert a people from certain opinions and propensities without any voluntary effort, and, as it were, without any distinct consciousness on their part. The whole art of the legislature is correctly to discern beforehand these natural inclinations of communities of men in order to know whether they should be assisted or whether it may not be necessary to check them. For the duties incumbent on the legislature differ at different times. The goal toward which the human race ought ever to be tending is alone stationary, the means of reaching it are perpetually to be varied. If I had been born in an aristocratic age, in the midst of a nation where the hereditary wealth of some and the irremediable pernary of others should equally divert men from the idea of bettering their condition, and hold the soul as it were in a state of torpor, fixed on the contemplation of another world, I should then wish that it were possible for me to rouse that people to a sense of their wants. I should seek to discover more rapid and more easy means for satisfying the fresh desires which I might have awakened, and, directing the most strenuous efforts of the human mind to physical pursuits, 
I should endeavor to stimulate it to promote the well-being of man. If it happened that some men were immoderately incited to the pursuit of riches and displayed an excessive liking for physical gratifications, I should not be alarmed. These peculiar symptoms would soon be absorbed in the general aspect of the people. The attention of the legislators of democracies is called to other cares. Give democratic nations education and freedom and leave them alone they will soon learn to draw from this world all the benefits which it can afford they will improve each of the useful arts and will day by day render life more comfortable more convenient and more easy their social condition naturally urges them in this direction i do not fear that they will slacken their course but whilst man takes delight in this honest and lawful pursuit of his well-being, it is to be apprehended that he may in the end lose the use of his sublimest faculties, and that whilst he is busied in improving all around him, he may at length degrade himself. Here, and here only, does the peril lie. It should therefore be the unceasing object of the legislators of democracies, and of all the virtuous and enlightened men who live there, to raise the souls of their fellow men, and keep them lifted up towards heaven. It is necessary that all who feel an interest in the future destinies of democratic society should unite, and that all should make joint and continual efforts to diffuse the love of the infinite, a sense of greatness, and a love of pleasures not of earth." If amongst the opinions of democratic people any of those pernicious theories exist which tend to inoculate that all perishes with the body, let men by whom such theories are professed be marked as the natural foes of such a people. The materialists are offensive to me in many respects. Their doctrines I hold to be pernicious and I am disgusted at their arrogance. If their system could be of any utility to man, it would seem to be by giving him a modest opinion of himself. But these reasoners show that it is not so, and when they think they have said enough to establish that they are brutes, they show themselves as proud as if they had demonstrated that they are gods. Materialism is amongst all nations a dangerous disease of the human mind but it is more especially to be dreaded amongst a democratic people because it readily amalgates with that vice which is most familiar to the heart under such circumstances democracy encourages a taste for physical gratification this taste if it become excessive soon disposes men to believe that all is matter only and materialism, in turn, hurries them back with mad impatience to these same delights. Such is the fatal circle within which democratic nations are driven round. It were well that they should see the danger and hold back. Most religions are only general, simple, and practical means of teaching men the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. That is the greatest benefit which a democratic people derives from its belief, and hence belief is more necessary to such a people than all others. When therefore any religion has struck its roots deep into democracy, beware lest you disturb them, but rather watch it carefully, as the most precious bequest of aristocratic ages. Seek not to supersede the old religious opinions of men by new ones, lest in the passage from one faith to another, the soul being left for a while stripped of all belief, the love of physical gratifications should grow upon it and fill it wholly. The doctrine of metempsychosis is assuredly not more rational than that of materialism. Nevertheless, if it were absolutely necessary that a democracy should choose one of the two, I should not hesitate to decide that the community would run less risk of being brutalized by believing that the soul of man will pass into the carcass of a hog 
than by believing that the soul of man is nothing at all. The belief in a super-sensual and immortal principle, united for a time to matter, is so indispensable to man's greatness that its effects are striking, even when it is not united to the doctrine of future reward and punishment, and when it holds no more than that after death the divine principle contained in man is absorbed in the deity, or transferred to animate the frame of another creature. Men holding so imperfect a belief will still consider the body as the secondary and inferior portion of their nature, and they will despise it even whilst they yield to its influence, whereas they have a natural esteem and secret admiration for the immaterial part of man, even though they sometimes refuse to submit to its dominion. That is enough to give a lofty cast to their opinions and their taste, and to bid them tend with no interested motive, and as it were by impulse to pure feelings and elevated thoughts. It is not certain that Socrates and his followers had very fixed opinions as to what would befall man hereafter, but the sole point of belief on which they were determined, that the soul has nothing in common with the body and survives it, was enough to give the Platonic philosophy that sublime aspiration by which it is distinguished. It is clear from the works of Plato that many philosophical writers, his predecessors or contemporaries, professed materialism. These writers have not reached us, or have reached us in mere fragments. The same thing has happened in almost all ages. The greater part of the most famous minds in literature adhere to the doctrines of supersensual philosophy. The instinct and the taste of the human race maintain those doctrines. They save them oftentimes in spite of men themselves, and raise the names of their defenders above the tide of time. It must not then be supposed that at any period or under any political condition the passion for physical gratifications and the opinions which are superinduced by that passion, can ever content a whole people. The heart of man is of a larger mold. It can at once comprise a taste for the possessions of earth and the love of those of heaven. At times, it may seem to cling devotedly to the one, but it will never be long without thinking of the other. If it be easy to see that it is more particularly important in democratic ages that spiritual opinion should prevail, it is not easy to say by what means those who govern democratic nations may make them predominant. I am no believer in the prosperity any more than in the durability of official philosophies. And as to state religions, I have always held that if they be sometimes of momentary service to the interest of political power, they always, sooner or later, become fatal to the church. Nor do I think with those who assert that to raise religion in the eyes of the people and to make them do honor to her spiritual doctrines, it is desirable indirectly to give her ministers a political influence which the laws deny them. I am so much alive to the almost inevitable dangers which beset religious belief whenever the clergy take part in public affairs. And I am so convinced that Christianity must be maintained at any cost in the bosom of modern democracies, that I had rather shut up the priesthood within the sanctuary than allow them to step beyond it. What means, then, remain in the hands of constituted authorities to bring men back to spiritual opinions, or to hold them fast to the religion by which those opinions are suggested? My answer will do me harm in the eyes of politicians. I believe that the sole effectual means which governments can employ in order to have the doctrine of the immortality of the soul duly respected is ever to act as if they believed in it themselves, and I think that it is only by scrupulous conformity to religious morality in great affairs that they can hope to teach the community at large to know, to love, and to observe it in the lesser concerns of life. 
Democracy in America, Volume 2, by Alex de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve, Part 2, Chapter 16, that excessive care of worldly welfare may impair that welfare. There is a closer tie than is commonly supposed between the improvement of the soul and the amelioration of what belongs to the body. Man may leave these two things apart and consider each of them alternately, but he cannot sever them entirely without at last losing sight of one and of the other. The beasts have the same senses as ourselves, and very nearly the same appetites. We have no sensual passions which are not common to our race and theirs, and which are not to be found at least in the germ, in a dog as well as in a man. Whence is it then that the animals can only provide for their first and lowest wants, whereas we can infinitely vary and endlessly increase our enjoyments. We are superior to the beasts in this, that we use our souls to find out those material benefits to which they are only led by instinct. In man, the angel teaches the brute the art of contenting its desires. It is because man is capable of rising above the things of the body, and of contemning life itself, of which the beasts have not the least notion, that he can multiply these same things of the body to a degree which inferior races are equally unable to conceive. Whatever elevates, enlarges, and expands the soul renders it more capable of succeeding in those very undertakings which concern it not. Whatever, on the other hand, enervates or lowers it, weakens it for all purposes, the chiefest as well as the least, and threatens to render it almost equally impotent for the one and for the other. Hence, the soul must remain great and strong, though it were only to devote its strength and greatness from time to time to the service of the body. If men were ever to content themselves with material objects, it is probable that they would lose by degrees the art of producing them, and they would enjoy them in the end like the brutes, without discernment and without improvement. End of Part 2, Chapter 16 Recording by hearhis.com